My name is Pauline Boss. I'm Professor Emeritus in the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. I've, re I've worked in the area of ambiguous loss for 40 years and most recently wrote a book about the myth of closure. How are the two ideas connected, ambiguous loss and myth of closure? First, let me define them. Ambiguous loss is a loss that has a no resolution. It's simply put a loss that remains unclear. There are two kinds of ambiguous losses. First is the physical ambiguous loss where the body is missing, person is kidnapped or lost at sea during the pandemic. It might have been a person in a hospital whom you could not visit and may have died alone without your being at their bedside. Aside from physical ambiguous losses, there are also psychological ambiguous losses where the mind is missing, but the body is there. The person may be in front of you, but they may have dementia. They've lost their memory or their cognitive abilities, uh, or they may have a serious mental illness, or they may be addicted. Uh, during the pandemic, there were also psychological ambiguous losses, such as loss in something abstract, like loss of trust in the world as a fair and safe place. Of course, there were physical ambiguous losses during the pandemic when you couldn't visit the people you loved, physically parted as we were sequestering for over a year, really. So then what is closure and how does it link to ambiguous loss? Well, early on, I, even I said that ambiguous loss, because it is unclear, has no closure. But that was actually an error because that implies that we want closure. Closure is not desired by people who lose loved ones. What they want is certainty. They want to know where the body is. They want to know what happened and why it happened. And that's different than closure. Closure is a perfectly good idea in business for business contracts. During the pandemic, we saw stores that closed. That's closure. But it's a bad word to use with human relationships. And people who have lost someone actually are, uh, feel hurt by people who use that word with them, thinking, uh, are you over it yet? Have you found closure? That is an unkind thing to say. Instead, what we should do is think in paradox and think both and. For, by that I mean, for example, the more you seek closure after a loss, the more likely you will have complicated grief, the harder it will be to move forward with life. So it's just the opposite of what we have been thinking, at least in this country. I'm not sure that the entire world would agree that closure is an ideal thing to have after loss. I think it may be uniquely American. And I'll say more about that in a minute. There are six guidelines that I've tested in, in the field um, with disasters and with therapy and clinic and in research that help people live with loss rather than seeking closure. The first is finding meaning. You have to make sense out of the loss. And many losses are meaningless, that is, they don't make sense. That too is a meaning. Um, mastery is the second one. And, and here is where Western cultures and especially the United States are especially high on wanting mastery over unanswered questions. And when you have loss, like from a pandemic with a virus we couldn't figure out, 
or even from an ordinary death, uh, you still may have unanswered questions. And the more mastery oriented a society is, the harder they will have to live with unanswered questions. We can borrow some ideas from more, from more Eastern cultures to ease our stress about that. Then there's identity. We need to change our identity after we've lost someone. We need to normalize our ambivalence after we've lost someone. It's not always our fault. The deaths during the pandemic, many other deaths uh, that come along from disease, um, accidents, old age are not our fault. And yet there's a tendency for human beings to blame themselves. And then there's attachment and we need to shift our attachment after someone we love is gone. And with ambiguous loss, it's particularly difficult to shift that attachment. Um, it's also difficult after a death, but at least you have clarity that you need to move forward in a new way. The same is true with ambiguous loss, but here again, we use both and thinking. I can move ahead with my life in a new way, and I can remember the person who is missing. Or as many people say, he's gone, but not for sure. And those kinds of paradoxical statements help lower the stress of people who suffer from ambiguous loss. It requires change to live with this kind of ambiguity. And therefore the tolerance for ambiguity is what we're trying to increase. Resilience is the tolerance for ambiguity when you have these kinds of losses. And during the pandemic, of course, we had so much uncertainty, so much um, death, so much in unanswered questions that we are now weary from the ambiguous losses that have happened during this time. There were clear losses, such as loss of income, which can be quantified, uh, how many deaths we had, and so on. But there were many, many unclear, ambiguous losses, such as I said, the loss of trust in the world as a safe place, the loss of trust in our leaders, perhaps, um, the loss of freedom to move about as we had the loss of routine and so on. So change is Im imperative for us to move forward after these kinds of losses. And change itself is stressful, but paradoxically, if you don't shift gears, if you don't change, the stress will be more difficult and immobilize you longer. I want to end with something that I wrote um, in a long time ago in the first book on ambiguous loss. And, and know that however you have suffered during this particular time in our history, the pandemic and then racism, which was uh, uncovered as something we needed to attend to more than we have in the past, and other kinds of societal problems came up as well, that we now are dealing with a lot of stress, not just the virus still, but with the change that is coming after it. The dilemma for all of us is to bring clarity to an ambiguous situation now. Failing that, and we will in most cases, the critical question is how to live with ambiguous losses. For each of us, the answer will be different. It will depend on culture and our belief systems. But the answers are less critical than the questions. I hope you are as curious as I have been about those questions. Thank you. <laughs>